Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the third part of my lecture series on the selected gross pathology of small ruminants. We're going to talk about gastrointestinal disease. But before I start, I want to thank, as I always do, my great friends and colleagues like Dr. Fabio Del Piero and Dr. John King, who provided so many of these images um, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with a very common birth defect of many species. We see it in small ruminants as well, nowhere near as often as we see it in camelids, but that's another lecture. Uh, this is palatoschisis or cleft palate, and it's caused when the lateral palatine shells do not grow enough to fuse down the center of the roof of the mouth. We're actually looking into the nasal cavity. Uh, this is either a very young kid or lamb. There appears to be some curdled milk in the nasal cavity. These animals do very poorly. They tend to reflux milk when they try to, uh, uh, to nurse through their nostrils. They're very susceptible to aspiration pneumonia. Uh, the best that you can hope for is a very underweight lamb. Um, this size of this defect is not really compatible with life. But there are other parts of the GI tract that can be affected by uh, congenital defects. When we talk about ruminants, both cattle and, and, uh, and small ruminants, uh, one of the more common defects that can be seen in multiple parts of the GI tract is atresia. Here we have atresia of the small intestine. Usually when you open these animals up you will see that the, the, the GI tract is dilated um, with milk and fecal material proximal to it and then distally there's very little or nothing. Uh, atrix segments of the, intention, of the intestine uh, may happen at any point uh, either in the small or large intestine and uh, they may fall into the categories of stenosis, which is a partial development, a partial occlusion, or complete occlusion, which is known as atresia. Uh, the, the precise cause of, of atresia of segments of the intestine is not known. But if you think about the development of the intestine, especially in ruminants, which has many parts, is extremely long, much longer than the space that the GI tract would normally allow. Realize that during the development, there is a tremendous amount of twisting and flipping and moving back and forth. And at any stage, um, if this movement is just a little bit off, you'll have compression of vessels going to that particular area. You'll have ischemic disease, damage to the germinative cells forming that segment of the gut, and they don't form. And so it's not uh, counterintuitive that we would have, uh, especially in animals with extremely complex GI systems, uh, atresia during development. And the treasure can also affect every part. Here we have an animal who is lacking an anus. So this is a treasia ana. It's been reported in uh, sheep. It's been reported as well as pigs and cattle and generally results when the dorsal membrane, which separates the rectum and anus, there's a, there's a very thin membrane of epithelium there as there is in many parts of the body and it needs to break down and for some reason in certain individual animals it doesn't break down. The clinical signs of this are generally apparent at birth um, and they include obviously abdominal distension and a lot of straining. Uh, most cases are untreatable. Some cases with partial atresia um, may be helped by breakdown of the membrane, but often it's not done because of economic reasons. Now as we move on to adult animals, this is a very common and a very important cause of morbidity and a reason why a lot of older animals are uh, sent to slaughter. 
And this is referred to in certain parts of the world. I like this term. It's called broken mouth. Um, if you do old sheep and goats, you will almost universally see that the teeth are generally worn out. Um, and you can see this in young animals or younger animals, uh, maybe sheep at four to five years of age uh, in areas with sandy soil. If you remember how sheep uh, eat, uh, Goats are very different. They're grazers, they nibble, they get into all sorts of things. But let's look at sheep. They're turned out on pasture. The pasture has a lot of sand and silica in it. Because of the way they eat, they, they reach down, they grab the grass close to the ground in, uh, in their, between their incisors and their dental pad on the top. And they pull it out, almost by the roots. Sheep are, are very uh, intense grazers like that. They'll graze a field down to stubble. But if they are constantly scraping through this sandy soil with those lower incisors, they will uh, wear out, you know, within a period of years in sandy areas. And especially if the, uh, uh, the animals have a sort of meager amount of certain minerals in their diet, so their teeth are, are, uh, are softer than normal. So broken mouth is a, a common problem resulting in ewes being sent to slaughter at the age of four or five in certain parts of the world. What we're looking at here is a severe case of uh, alveolitis, tooth loss, uh, dental retraction. This is an animal, and I can't tell you the age of this one, but this is an animal that has gotten just about everything it can out of these teeth. You can see that the teeth um, grow because you have malocclusion and tooth loss. You have a spike here and a much enlarged molar here. This is known as wave mouth. So dental problems are uh, a real consideration in small ruminants. Uh, here is uh, a young animal and there is a large area of necrosis uh, in the nasal cavity in the alveolar bone and this is a case of uh, Fusobacterium necrophorum infection. We've seen this in cattle, we see this in uh, small ruminants as well. Uh, Fusobacterium necrophorum is a common commensal inhabitant of the GI tract and the respiratory tract of uh, uh, small ruminants and cattle. Uh, you can see it all the time. It is omnipresent in the environment. Every time they take a poop, uh, it's in the poop. So it's always there. The problem is if they are uh, eating rough feed or in the case of goats, if they're chewing on things that they shouldn't and they poke a hole in their gums, it can be contaminated by Fusobacterium necrophorum. And that's a bacterium that enjoys anaerobic environments uh, in that time, in those areas, they will. So if you get it, let's say you get an injection and it heals over, it's perfect for any fused bacterium in there to begin to proliferate, to, uh, to elaborate some very potent cytotoxins and causes tremendous areas of necrosis uh, within the mucosa and up into the bones of the jaws, the condition is called necro. And uh, you see it even more commonly in times when animals are, are stressed, they're overcrowded, when it's hot, when it's cold, etc. And it's a bacterium that is always going to be there and should always be considered in necrotizing lesions of the oral cavity. Well, here's our mention of uh, first mention of a disease that we are going to see uh, in a number of systems, and we are looking at a goat with scabby proliferative lesions on the lips, around the uh, the mucosa of the nostrils. Uh, you can see this within the mucosa of the oral cavity and the mucosa going all the way down. Uh, into the forestomach. So you can even see this in the esophagus and the, uh, 
the rumen, the reticulum, and the omasum. Not in the abomasum because then the epithelium changes from stratified squamous to glandular and it becomes resistant to this. Uh, this particular condition is known as contagious eczema. Uh, it is called ORF in people. It is a zoonotic disease. And uh, it is caused by a parapox virus. We talked a lot about parapox viruses in, the, uh, uh, in a number of animal species. And the lesions that they cause are very stereotypical. And that's nice for us because you never have to think about a morphologic diagnosis when you see a pox viral induced lesion, a parapox viral induced lesion, such as contagious eczema. Uh, it is always a proliferative and necrotizing dermatitis. Some are more necrotizing, some are more proliferative. This one looks pretty proliferative, but there's a scabbiness to it. And the reason that they're always proliferative and necrotizing, as I said so many times before, is upon initial infection, the virus causes tremendous proliferation of the epithelium within the strabospinosum because it needs cells to infect. And then after it's infected, those cells over time those cells will produce a lot of viral particles and then that cell will rupture and become necrotic and when you get a focus of necrotic cells uh, around each other it forms an ulcer ultimately a scab of uh, the center of these lesions are usually the oldest center of these lesions are usually the areas of necrosis so when you look grossly at them you'll see a ring of proliferating epithelium and a central area of necrosis and that is the classic Pock. Uh, contagious ectomis, ectoma is seen all around the world wherever sheep and goats are raised. Um, it's a very long-lived virus. Um, it tends to uh, persist in the environment and, and the virus has been demonstrated to uh, uh, survive at room temperature for 15 years. Uh, in the very, very early days of vaccination when when people were using cowpox scabs from humans uh, to go and vaccinate for a smallpox, a much more severe disease. Um, the vaccinologist, often the, the village or the county uh, medical practitioner, would literally take scabs from, from somebody with, with uh, cowpox and they would put it on the arm of a, a person needing to be vaccinated and they would stick a needle through it several times injecting that material into the skin underneath. So, and they would carry these scabs around for years. Uh, this disease, and it's very important, not as a cause of death, but uh, just uh, morbidity. And remember when we talk about production animals like sheep and goats, it's about production. It's about putting on weight. It is about uh, getting milk. Uh, so anything that interferes with that process is of economic importance. Uh, it usually affects younger animals, especially suckling lamb and kids. They tend to contaminate the teats uh, of the dam, and then if another animal comes over to nurse, it can be spread like that. When you see it, you can have up to 100% morbidity in your, uh, uh, your crop of younger animals. And because these animals can get these big scabs, they can be sore, they're sort of reluctant to eat and they'll experience weight loss. So our first introduction in this lecture series to, uh, to contagious eczema. As we said before, it is not simply a disease of the outside of the face. You can see it within the, uh, uh, within the oral cavity as scabby areas. And viral infections um, in ruminants can often affect the gingival areas because that's an area that, you know, look at how they're eating. They're tearing the grass up with their teeth. There's always a lot of friction there. And there is the opportunity for injection of the virus, especially in the gingiva. So we tend to see a lot of viral diseases that affect the mouth be concentrated in and around the gingiva. So make sure that you do a good inspection of the gingival areas when you're thinking of diseases like contagious eczema, uh, like 
uh, bovine viral diarrhea, which is a virus that affects the epithelium in cattle. Always a productive area to examine. Well, here's a terrible uh, case of this. You can pretty well imagine how this animal is not going to want to, to, not, to nurse or suckle or eat, depending on its age. We have extensive scabbing of the lips. We have uh, ulceration and proliferation of the epithelium of the dental pad. And that gingiva right here is just as affected as any of the rest of the animal. And a great picture uh, by Dr. John King. Whoops. And we are down in the rumen and reticulum. And you can see the proliferation here of the epithelium that has been infected by the parapox virus, probably brought down by uh, roughage and then injected into that mucosa. And it will look exactly like a pock anywhere else. Proliferation with a necrotic center. This disease does not kill a whole lot of animals, but it certainly will wreck the production values in a particular flock. I have had arguments with, with people who work extensively with sheep and goats that uh, it is not a zoonotic disease, um, but it certainly uh, is. Uh, those particular individuals might have been very lucky, but handling these animals um, if you inoculate that virus into your skin, you are going to get a particularly nasty, I have heard they're extremely painful lesions. And this is a classic pock with the proliferation in, in people that are generally surrounded by a red ring with an area of proliferation and a central area of necrosis. A classic pock. And hopefully uh, this person has had recent contact with an animal a sheep or a goat with parapox, uh, which makes it a very easy diagnosis. This particular picture comes from, come, comes to us from the CDC, and the uh, these particular lesions are m obviously most commonly seen uh, in animals that are in people that work with small ruminants. So veterinarians um, account for a number of these uh, abattoir workers who are working with knives around carcasses. Wool shearers, uh, the, the process of removing uh, wool from sheep is not the uh, uh, least traumatic, especially for the sheep, but also uh, for the people who are wielding those clippers. And uh, just uh, farmers' children and, and housewives and anybody that's 4-H, uh, doing 4-H work or something with these infected animals. So just be, be careful when you are dealing with these animals. And I think that a recently deceased goat, uh, the parapox, would be just as viable uh, in those scabs as in a live one. So it's something to, to think about. Here's a fantastic picture, um, which was published a number of years ago in Bedpath by Jim McLaughlin of University of California, Davis, who knows more about this disease than than anybody else has published a number of outstanding articles, book chapters, um, and has really contributed to the knowledge of this disease of sheep. And I start with this picture of a swollen, a very cyanotic tongue because the disease um, is caused by an orbivirus and goes by the name of blue tongue. This is a vector-borne viral disease of both wild and domestic ruminants. It is not specific to sheep. It can cause devastating disease in cattle as well. It is spread by culicoides, a species of insect vectors, and will result in infected uh, herds in up to 80% mortality and 30% sorry, 80% morbidity and 30% mortality when a new strain, and there are a number of strains of this virus, when a new strain is introduced into the herd. Uh, this is a virus that is, as we will see in a number of lectures, causes lesions in 
a variety of organs because the virus initially uh, infects uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, and monocytes, uh, which allows it to travel throughout the body and in distant areas will infect endothelial cells. And, and what you see with this virus and many of the other Orbi viruses, because of its endotheliotropic nature, is you see tremendous hemorrhage and swelling uh, in multiple areas. And any time you infect endothelial cells, you will result in thrombosis. And you can result in a necrosis of overlying epithelium. And this is the reason for the tremendous ulceration that you can see in the GI tract of animals with blue tongue. As we'll see in other uh, lectures, uh, it also, if it infects uh, animals within certain stages of gestation, will cause significant abnormalities, especially in the nervous system if sheep or, or cattle are infected um, in a very particular window uh, in and around 75 days of gestation. It really hits the germinative epithelium in the cerebrum and results in significant uh, nervous defects such as hydranencephaly or poor encephaly. So this is a great picture here. Um, probably not uh, uh, seen in too many animals, but this amount of, of cyanosis thrombosis, swelling, and necrosis of the overlying epithelium should make you want to think about, about a blue tongue. I think that one of the more common appearances of blue tongue are ulcerations and hemorrhages uh, within the uh, gastrointestinal tract. And we'll see a lot of these. This animal also has cyanosis and swelling of the tongue. Uh, it's difficult to say whether um, this is scabbing, perhaps from contagious ectoma or multiple etiologies, or simply this is a tremendous amount of, of uh, uh, discharge, uh, matted saliva, maybe nasal discharge from an animal who is not eating. But a fantastic picture here of uh, multifocal to coalescing ulceration of the uh, dental pad, the hard palate, and the lips. So it'll cause a necrohemorrhagic stomatitis, and I think it's a pretty classic lesion to think about with blue tongue. Once again, due to thrombosis and necrosis of overlying epithelium, a very common pathogenesis of many of the endotheliotropic viruses. These ulcers will go down uh, into many parts of the GI tract, especially down into the four stomachs. And you will see, and I'm not ready to go there yet, but you will see hemorrhage and necrosis in the rumen especially, because the rumen is always moving and you get a lot of friction. And, and all of these, the, these areas of necrosis and hemorrhage are, are more commonly seen in areas of friction because of that epithelium is devitalized due to lack of a blood supply and more likely to uh, to, to come off. Um, I don't want to say that this is a pathognomonic lesion for blue tongue. As, as good a lesion as this is, you need to think about a number of other viral diseases which cause ulceration and necrosis in the GI tract. And we're going to look at some of these as well. And they may infect uh, either small ruminants, cattle, or both. Uh, one of the ones that we don't see anymore but normally causes ulceration uh, in, in cattle was rinderpest. Uh, unfortunately, even though rinderpest has very thankfully been eradicated, there is a very closely related disease uh, caused by a similar morbidity virus that still affects sheep and goats around the world that is in desperate need of eradication. So many more people in the world uh, subsist on small ruminants than large ruminants. But uh, so that particular morbidity virus causes the same ulceration throughout the GI tract 
and concomitant respiratory signs. There are a number of GI diseases which cause ulceration. There are very few that will cause both GI and respiratory signs. And I'm referring to pestite du, pestis du petit ruminants, or plague of small ruminants, uh, if you will. And it will cause the same type of ulceration in the GI tract with superimposed respiratory things, which help us identify that one a little easier. Uh, two other diseases that you have to consider in small ruminants uh, are, are ovine pestivirus. It doesn't get anywhere near the play that, that uh, uh, the pestivirus that causes BVD in cattle does, but sheep do have their own pestivirus, which will cause diarrhea and ulcerations in the GI tract. It's probably better known for the congenital neurologic defects that it causes uh, in Harry Shaker Lamb syndrome. And then finally, uh, you also need to think about another endotheliotropic or vasculotropic disease, which will cause necrosis of the, of the overlying epithelium, and that is malignant catarrhal fever. We used to think malignant catarrhal fever were pri was primarily a disease of, of cattle. We have known for many years that wild ruminants and most recently sheep um, have are carriers. The, this particular virus does not cause problems in the natural host, but when it jumps host, it usually causes issues with a severe lymphoid proliferation, which targets vessels throughout the body. Those vessels become thrombosed, and then we get uh, ulcerations, uh, especially in the GI tract. Within the last 15 or 20 years, there's been a tremendous body of information that sheep not only carry uh, one of these viruses that causes disease in other ruminant species, known as ovine herpes virus type 2, but also that they may be susceptible, susceptible to their own ovine herpes virus type 2 in animals that have a very heavy viral load, violating or refuting that principle that uh, sheep don't get their own malignant catarrhal fever. Yes, they can, and they can cause ulcerative lesions. So, so when I see something like this, I'm going to think about blue tongue, but I'm also going to consider ovine pestivirus, pestis du petit ruminants, and malignant catarrhal fever. Okay, so we are now in the rumen, and you can tell by the ruminal papilla here, these are the pillars of the rumen, and you can see that the rumen has an overall pinkness to it, a congestion, and the mucosa is starting to come off. And if you were to handle this, a lot of that might come off in your hands. And this particular picture is associated with ruminal acidosis or grain overload. Usually when animals are given a lot of uh, uh, rapidly or easily fermentable carbohydrates, they can break into the feed room or somebody who was well-meaning gives them a, a double ration of carbohydrate. It's not the only time you can see it. You can also see it in very young animals uh, who have a uh, defective ruminoreticular groove and allows the uh, milk which normally goes straight to the abomasum to get into the rumen where uh, it can be fermented over time or it ferments over time. But usually it's associated with carbohydrates. This is not the only condition that's associated with that. We're going to look at a number of other ones too, but it certainly is one that everybody should be familiar with. Um, just a brief review of the pathogenesis is probably in order because it is very important, but the normal rumen has a pH about 6.5 and uh, has a very specific microflora of gram-negative bacteria and protozoa, which largely uh, provide actually the protein requirements of the animal. If you ever wondered why a, a cow or, or a goat or a sheep can eat just grass and live, they're getting their protein from all of the ciliates and the protozoa and the, uh, the bacteria that are living on breaking down that cellulose. They're not getting anything out of the grass. 
themselves. And, and that, that particular microbiome has to be very carefully regulated. But when you put a lot of uh, very fermentable carbohydrates in that particular organ, um, they're broken down into volatile fatty acids. And those fatty acids will lower the pH of the rumen and allow certain bacteria to overgrow. As the pH drops, a lot of the normal gram-negative flora are replaced by Streptococcus bovis, which worsens the problem because one of the products of byproducts of its digestion uh, are a variety of acids, including a lot of lactic acids, in, in addition to a couple of other minor components like formic acid and succinic acid. But lactic acid is the one that really starts a rapid drop in the pH. And as that uh, uh, pH drops from 6.5 to 4.5 or lower, the, uh, uh, the streptococcus themselves are killed off and give way to a overgrowth of lactobacillus, which tells you a lot about that disease. It's going to produce a lot more lactic acid and continue to drive uh, down that ruminal pH. Um, in that very low pH of the rumen now, um, it causes activation of epithelial receptors, which shut down normal peristalsis, and the rumen sort of at this point is sort of a still uh, vat of fluid with um, a lot of bacterial agents. There is tremendous influx of water to try and dilute out all of these substances. And so the animal, uh, their rumen is stilled and through reflex action, they stop producing saliva, uh, which normally will buffer the pH. So they have a still rumen they have a uh, absence of buffering capacity from the saliva and they have a tremendous increase in osmotic pressure which draws in fluid from the rest of the body uh, which makes them essentially hypovolemic uh, and extreme metabolic acidosis. So you can see how this is a, uh, uh, a real dire situation. Um, the chemical environment will result in uh, vacuolation of histologically of those epithelial cells, degeneration, and eventually sloughing. And so you will get uh, you will get loss of the epithelium. There's often a uh, uh, it's because the process is not paracute. You will see a reaction histologically in many cases of ruminal acidosis where you will get pustules or influx of neutrophils into that devitalized mucosa before it sloughs. And it's a very characteristic histologic picture, which is not shared by too many agents. Rumal acidosis being by far the most common. And in some parts of the world, there are actually uh, plant toxins, which cause a similar lesion. Um, not all the other things that, that uh, are part of the ruminal acidosis picture, but a similar lesion. Um, so it's a great gross picture. I do want to caution you that that autolytic rumens, if, if the animal has been in the cooler over the weekend or been out in the field for a while, this, uh, this epithelium will slough as well when you handle the rumen, but you don't have a history of uh, the animal getting into the grain. You don't have the presence of the grain itself in the rumen, and uh, you don't have this tremendous congestion and edema that you can see in the wall. So so you'll, as part of the normal decomposition, the rumen epithelium will slough. There are a lot of bacteria and protozoa in there that don't know the animal's dead, but you just don't see the gross and histologic picture. So every time you see sloughing renal epithelium, don't jump to the opinion this animal died of ruminal acidosis. Now, okay, so if the animal survives this metabolic crisis, and it is a crisis, um, 
that's not the end of this picture. Unfortunately, these areas which are denuded of epithelium are ripe for the invasion of a number of survivors. And I call them survivors because these are the agents that have the ability to live in the very low pH of the acidotic rumen. Um, certain bacteria, our friend Fusobacterium is one that has no trouble in there. Uh, a number of fungal species um, often will be present and will use this opportunity to invade the ruminal mucosa. And you end up with areas of infarction in the previous areas of ulceration. Okay, These areas were ulcerated, there was loss of the mucosa, and they have been secondarily invaded by a variety of these. This could be Fusobacterium necrophorum. Um, this tissue is dead. It is infarcted. There is an area of hemorrhage around it, which usually says that you know there has been infarction and there's loss of blood supply, and then around this dead tissue you get hemorrhage and you get white blood cells that want to go in and clean this up, but they're all backed up because there's no vascular uh, ability. There's no vessels that are patent in these areas. Um, I would think if it is more acute, I would probably go with something like Fusobacterium necrophorum, which gets in there and sets up shop in a, a couple of days. Fungi are a little different. They tend to be a little bit farther down the road. Um, they will invade, but because they need to grow, um, they need to develop hyphae, which can damage vessels. That's often seen uh, days to weeks after the initial insult. As I said before, once you get past the initial insult, the metabolic acidosis uh, and cardiovascular insufficiency or shock, you have all of these sequelae that you can get further down the road. Um, and then even further down the road, you could have uh, a series of abscesses which progress from the wall of the gut into the liver and ultimately possibly even into the respiratory tract. Um, so you can have sequela months down the road from a case of ruminal acidosis. So it's a syndrome that is extended temporally for a long period of time. And all of these need to be considered. Um, before I leave this, this is a, a not uncommon uh, slide that may be on a certification exam. So uh, I particularly like the morphologic diagnosis, and this is always a two-parter because vasculitis is involved. This is multifocal to coalescing ruminal vasculitis with mucosal necrosis. Okay, that's two. If I'm grading out those papers, I'm looking that the person understood that this is primarily a vasculitis and then secondarily necrosis over the top. That's the way vasculitis usually does, uh, whether it's in the skin, whether it's a dermal vasculitis with uh, epidermal necrosis, such as we would see in swine where there are syphilithrix or, or frogs with red leg. Um, we see the same thing in the GI tract in animals with ruminal acidosis. The long-term sequela are often due to vasculitis. You know, this is a, a picture that has been around for uh, a long time. A lot of the these pictures come to us from uh, the Foreign Animal Disease Center at Plum Island. This one has been around forever and ever. I'm not crazy about this picture, but there just aren't that many other good pictures. This is, uh, at least in this country, this is a foreign animal disease. Um, we are looking, if you're having trouble figuring out what you are looking at, we're looking at the oral cavity. The, the, the jaw has been sort of split. This is the top of the goat's head, and this is the tongue. This is the epiglottis. And, and what I want you to see is the uh, uh, proliferation uh, of epithelium, there is ulceration going on here in the GI tract of this goat. I apologize, there's not more hemorrhage, it's not the best picture, but I'm a little bit limited. 
because uh, there just aren't that many pictures of pestis du petit rumen, uh, ruminants out there or small ruminant morbili virus. As we said before, this is a pneumogastroenteritis. I sort of like that term because it, it's pneumo because it concurrently affects the respiratory tract. These animals have a severe bronchopneumonia. They often have a nasal discharge and it's accompanied by necrosis and ulceration throughout the GI tract and these animals may have diarrhea or something else but we have two major systems going on or diseases of major systems going on at the same time in uh, uh, morbili virus infection. This is a, a disease, as I said before, you know, is just as important, or maybe even more important than rinderpest, caused by a similar agent, and because of the reliance of so many people in the world on small ruminants and the tremendous mobility of a small ruminants, it's easier to move them. People who have sheep and goats, for some reason, always love to put them in the back of the truck and drive them around, um, and so the mobility tends to larger spread bigger outbreaks and much more difficult to control. This is a disease that was first identified in Africa in 1942, um, but has been identified in many uh, countries of the world. It is not, uh, it is a reportable disease, obviously, in the U.S. And, and uh, um, as I said before, all these pictures are from the Foreign Animal Disease Center. Okay, so that's a lot of the ulcerations of, of the, uh, the upper GI tract. I just want to hit a couple of other ones, uh, other diseases of the upper GI tract. And we're looking at uh, cross sections of the esophagus or one of one or multiple animals. And we're, there are these large white bulging nodules within the epithelium. And I've always liked this parasite. I hate when they change names. Um, each of these white nodules is actually a single skeletal muscle cell of the wall of the esophagus and these these cells are tremendously enlarged by the presence, the intracytoplasmic presence of innumerable sarcocystis zoites. There's no inflammation here. These are just really really large skeletal muscle cells. And the name of this parasite, there's only one. When we get down into the, the intestine of sheep and goats, there are so many different types, but there's only one really that causes this lesion, affects the esophagus. And it used to be called, rightfully enough, Sarcocystis gigantea. And that was easy to remember. But over the years, people have started naming uh, Sarcocyst species by the uh, life cycle. And so this is actually Sarcocystis ovophilus now. Not as easy to remember as Sarcocystis gigantea, uh, but it does tell you that the definitive host of this Sarcocyst is going to be a cat. Disease usually doesn't cause much of any problems. Uh, the animals, even those have been inoculated with these, generally show at best a mild fever and the vast majority of these sarcocysts don't rupture or cause any type of inflammation. Okay, here is going to be our first introduction to a very important disease of small ruminants and we are looking at the outside of the rumen and you see these patches of echomotic hemorrhage uh, within the serosa, within the muscularis and they are probably transmural. This is not truly a disease of the rumen um, but if you looked at this particular animal you would see hemorrhages throughout often within the GI tract, but in other areas and other organs as well. Obviously, you want to think about the endotheliotropic viruses, 
toxins that we've mentioned before, like blue tongue. But this is a bacterial disease which results in uh, hemorrhage in some not so critical, like the outside of the rumen, but a lot of critical places uh, in affected animals. The disease is known as enterotoxemia, and it is caused by the uh, bacterium Clostridium perfringens type D. It also may be kicked off by a bolus of carbohydrate, um, which allows overgrowth of Clostridium perfringens type D in the intestine. But it is not ruminal acidosis. The other thing, because we are looking at hemorrhages in the rumen, um, I don't jump to ruminal acidosis as well. You don't generally see transmural hemorrhages with ruminal acidosis. Now, the, the bottom line of Clostridium perfringens type D is that you have a bolus usually of easily fermentable carbohydrate, which causes a pH change at this point in the intestine and allows the overgrowth of Clostridium perfringens type D, which produces a wide range of toxins. But one particular toxin, the epsilon toxin that is produced, um, is a vasoactive toxin. In the intestine, it allows for uh, necrosis of endothelial cells. It opens up the vascular system, so to speak, and it becomes absorbed systemically. And this allows it to wreak havoc in areas far beyond the intestine. So this is why we see hemorrhages throughout the body. I apologize for those of you who thought you were hearing a baby in the background. That was Finn the cat. And uh, I often have to shut down uh, the recording for a moment when Finn decides to, uh, to sing the song of his people. And one of the times that he does this is he will go into the bathroom and look at himself in the mirror and he is so struck by his handsomeness that he has to sing. And that's what we were hearing. So I apologize uh, for that. Part of the problem of, uh, of doing these at home. Okay, have a seat. You're a good-looking boy. Okay, so we were talking about the we were talking about the epsilon toxin, um, which causes uh, many of the lesions that are associated with enterotoxemia. We're going to see this again when we get to the nervous system because it tends to affect uh, the basal parts of the brain in a disease called focal symmetrical encephalomalacia, uh, and we will also see it when we get to the urinary system. This is associated with a change in the kidney known as pulpy kidney disease. There are a number of clostridial agents of note that we want to think about, um, not all of which have really good uh, lesions. Uh, if we think about clostridium perfringens, uh, type A, uh, this will cause hemolysis in small ruminants. And I don't think I have any good pictures of that in this lecture series. I'll have to see if I can dig some out. Um, Clostridium type C, perfringens type C, uh, tends to affect adult sheep and cause ne necrohemorrhagic enterocolitis, the beta toxin, is normally invalidated by trypsin in the gut. So clostridium perfringens type C is one we'll look at later on in the gut, which causes infection in young animals. And here we are with clostridium perfringens type D, enterotoxemia, and very characteristically, it often affects the best and the, the fastest growing uh, lambs in the flock. These are the ones that uh, tend to muscle the other ones out of the way for the food. They can push them away from the concentrate and get an overdose of that enough to to cause overgrowth of, of Clostridium perfringens type D, liberation of the epsilon toxin, entry into the systemic circulation, hemorrhage in multiple organs. So 
this is not the last time we will see this agent so let's keep this one in mind here's another picture of something that you might associate um, with enterotoxemia I also mentioned enterotoxemia causing uh, hemorrhages within vessels and it might cause a hemorrhage in the vessels of the heart which could be confused with blue tongue uh, probably is more common to do that than blue tongue. We don't see a lot of blue tongue. But, uh, so hemorrhages throughout the body, uh, I'm thinking uh, first and foremost of Clostridium perfringens type D. Oh, here's a, here's a great picture by my friend Ildiko Erdelli, who uh, is currently working now in Australia. And uh, we are looking at a form of bloat in a sheep and this is the rumen it is over distended the animal often will die of asphyxiation because the rumen gets so distended with this material uh, that they are uh, unable to eructate um, this is known as this particular form is known as frothy bloat any type of bloat is over distension of the rumen and reticulum um, with material. In the normal animal, it's gas in nature, and so the animal can release the valve, release the gas, and, uh, uh, and essentially uh, belch. And it releases the, the, it reduces the size of the gas cap and, and keeps the rumen to a size where it's not compressing on the lungs. Or the other viscera. Um, however, in animals that eat a uh, uh, a tremendous amount of finely digestible forage, uh, a number of things happen. You get this plant protein which binds that gas and incorporates it into a foam which cannot be eructated and that plant protein lends a stability to the presence of small bubbles in this foam so they don't combine and form larger bubbles and larger bubbles and then contribute to the gas cap so it's a stable foam as a result of incorporation of hemicellulose and some soluble leaf proteins and saponins and uh, at the normal pH of the stomach at six, uh, the rumen at 6.5, this is where these plant proteins are at their most stable. Okay, so the, the gas cap is not formed, the animals cannot eructate. And on top of that, we have tremendous distension, as we saw before in rumen acidosis, distension and stretching of the rumen. For some reason, it's counterintuitive to me. Um, you have a shutdown of saliva production and salivary bicarbonate contribution to this. So this is what is known as frothy bloat. Um, in animals with frothy bloat, death rates of 20 to 30 percent are often seen. Another another name that you might hear is primary ruminal tympany, what we call this frothy bloat. Just a couple of of, uh, of the many plants that have been incriminated in uh, uh, frothy bloat um, are mostly legume or legume dominated pastures, uh, red and white clover, ladino. Um, young green cereal crops like turnips and uh, kale and, and, and rape. And as always, um, alfalfa is thrown in there. Alfalfa seems to be blamed for a lot, but so many animals that graze alfalfa, I really figured that one out. So this animal's probably grazing a, a field that has a lot of legumes in it contributes a lot more plant protein which solubilizes the gas in the foam. So that is frothy bloat. Just another picture, a close-up where you can see and normally all these little bubbles will rupture and they'll coalesce. You've, we've all taken bubble baths and see how a couple small bubbles will form a large bubble and then that'll pop and the gas will come off. 
doesn't happen in frothy bloat. Now, this is another form of bloat or ruminal impaction. And uh, you see here that the rumen is largely impacted by dry feed material. There's a couple of possibilities here. One is a very poorly formed, uh, uh, a poorly understood condition known as dysautonomia. And dysautonomia is a condition in which the neurons of the ganglia of the digestive system as well as neurons within the submucosal plexi of various segments of the gut will undergo degeneration. It's known as grass sickness, primarily affects cattle but can affect horses. Uh, there are variants uh, in the western United States and the midwestern United States that affect dogs um, and really no particular agent has been identified. The syndrome is well known and well described. Nobody's figured out exactly what causes it. And it can affect sheep too, resulting in an abomasal or a ruminal emptying defect. The abomasal form is primarily seen in, in Suffolk sheep. So abomasal or ruminal emptying defects as a result of dysautonomia or grass sickness. And here's the abomasum from one of those Suffolk sheep. And you can see that there is a large area of infarction as a result of the tremendous distension of the abomasum. This is very similar to a lesion that you'll see in the, uh, in the bladder of cats that are blocked. And what happens over time, that greatly distended hollow viscous gets so big that the veins within the walls are stretched and stretch to a point where the lumen is compromised or becomes essentially non-existent and then you get a nice venous infarct and that's what's happened here in this abomasum. Okay, a couple of other things that we will see in the rumen. Here we have a, a concretion of plant material, which is seen in the rumen of this particular goat, because it's primarily composed of plant fibers, which are uh, held together by a bunch of calcium carbonate salts. We're going to call this a phytobezoar. Now this is something that you will see in, primarily in goats. Uh, my good friend Fabio Del Piero um, has called these plastobezoars in here uh, because you know goats can be discriminate, indiscriminate eaters at some time. They'll eat a bunch of stuff that they shouldn't. So this one was composed primarily of uh, a bit of rope, plastic bags, and some canvas bags. So these will end up in the room and they'll get all tied up. Now it often won't cause a problem, um, but something of this size can cause obstruction as you can imagine. And then that will be a problem. This is uh, uh, especially seen in animals around the world that are kept in, uh, in and around uh, dumps where they have the ability to get into uh, a lot of garbage and a study was done uh, interestingly enough in a town in, in Nigeria um, where they just looked at goats that that lived around garbage dumps and they found a lot of these uh, type of bezoars which contained everything from uh, cellophane materials plastic bags ropes metallic objects paper and various fibers. So uh, plastobezoars, I think that's his good name. 
today, Class of Bezoars is a great name, so thank you, Dr. Del Piero, for that. Okay, we are now moving into the abomasum. And you can see in this particular abomasum, the abomasal folds are greatly distended by edema. That's the number one change I want you to see here. Now, this is a great picture. We always use the worst in the lectures. But there is also a tremendous amount of hemorrhage. And with Hemorrhage always comes necrosis. Necrosis is the more important. My morphologic diagnosis for something like this would be a necrohemorrhagic uh, abomasitis with edema. And I think edema is the most commonly seen lesion associated with an infection of the abomasum, You're normally by Clostridium septicum, which goes by the name of Braxy or sometimes Bradsot. Um, Clostridium septicum is the classic agent that is associated with this. Over the last few years, a number of other related syndromes have been added to this. Clostridium perfringens type A um, has been associated with a syndrome of abomasal tympani, inflammation and ulceration in calves, and a very interesting agent, um, which is seen up in the upper right-hand corner. Sarcina ventriculi has been incriminated in some cases in Oklahoma by Dr. Roger Pansiera. I don't think it, that it's totally accepted as a cause of praxy. Um, and you can see it in normal abomasi as well, but Dr. Pansiera is a very, very intelligent man. And and normally when he spoke, I would listen, so I add that to the list. But in all the textbooks, I think the, the common uh, agent is Clostridium septicum. Um, this has often been seen in sheep. It's much more sheep thing than a goat thing. It's, it's often been seen in sheep in cold temperatures. And one of the takeaways from that that I've never really agreed with is that you know, these animals are ingesting, are ingesting frozen feedstuffs and frozen herbage. Uh, and that it is, uh, because it's frozen, it pokes holes in the abomasum. And, and it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, because that's the abomasum. And that, that roughage has gone through the process of chewing, swallowing. It probably sat in the room and for a long time. It is plenty of time to bring it up to uh, the room temperature, so or the body temperature. So, so I, I don't really agree with that. I think it's probably more just the disease of uh, cold climate countries in which the soil has been seeded by Clostridium septicum. Clostridium septicum is a condition that um, also can cause gas gangrene. I think it's just seen in. Uh, uh, mountainous areas where the uh, agent can persist uh, for a long time. We know that it can persist in feces for up to a year, and I'm sure in cold climates you really never get it out of the environment. The other thing is that it's never been reliably and experimentally reproduced um, under experimental conditions. So it's a, a very classic lesion, but as we said before, you'll see the edema as the main gross finding more than you will see this hemorrhage and abomasitis. So for your test, it's a necrohemorrhagic abomasitis, and for possible causes, Clostridium septicum, Clostridium perfringens, type A, and Sarcina ventriculi, um, but there's a lot still to be figured out about this particular condition. Well, okay, let's move into some, some parasites. And if you've, if you've worked with uh, sheep or goats, this is one that is a major cause of morbidity and I think also mortality. Um, we are looking at the uh, abomasum and you can see a large number of these sort of reddish worms within the abomasum. 
And on closer inspection, um, you can see the reason that they are called the barber pole worm. Okay, this is Homonchus contortus. And Homonchus contortus lives in the abomasum. It is a blood sucking parasite. That's where it gets the name Homonchus. So that red portion is ingested blood. You can also see that the background uh, abomasum that it's laying on looks very pale. A good infection of these agents will rapidly result in anemia and this will be manifested throughout the entire animal as a extremely pale carcass. Look at the color of the liver. Okay, this is not a normal healthy liver. Everything looks very pale. So you get a very pale carcass. The animals are often very thin. And the other thing that you will see is a lot of edema um, to the point, especially in the submandibular area. It's all dependent, as edema will be, but in the submandibular area, it is known as bottle jaw. Thank you, Dr. Janiti, for this great picture from, uh, I think it's the California Animal Health and Food Safety System. But uh, so a very pale edematous carcass, and then you go and look for the parasites. Sometimes you see them every once in a while, you come across one that you just can't find them. I'm not exactly sure the cause of that, but the other signs in the animal are irrefutable. Uh, just, to, just to go back here, you see this barber pole worm, and you have the red stripe, which is the blood, and the white stripe, and the white stripe are the eggs in the gravid females. That is the distended uterus, and those are all eggs, and they are prodigious egg layers, and they will quickly contaminate the ground. So uh, hemonchiasis can be a real problem in herds in which rigorous uh, worming is not performed. So homonchus. It is amazing to me how many what percentage of the goats, and I live in a fairly affluent uh, part of, of, of Maryland, and a lot of people have goats, and, and goats are absolutely cute. I think they're friendly, wonderful animals, but it seems like almost every goat that comes in for necropsy in this area are underweight, uh, they're parasitized, and it goes back to the fact that Taking care of any animal is expensive. Taking care of it well, people have this idea that, that they can just put goats out anywhere and they will thrive. But they will become parasitized. They will become a very ill thrift. They'll have dental problems. Wormers are cheap, but it seems like most people that keep small ruminants, at least in this area, believe that it's easier to replace one or two than it is to keep them healthy. So we see a lot of emaciation and a lot of parasitism, which just doesn't need to happen. So let me get off my soapbox on the, the keeping of small ruminants. We're looking at the intestine, and these are nodules, which are within the, we're just staying on the parasites right now. These are nodules in the wall of the intestine, uh, sorry, I said intestine, in the abomasum. Um, and this is a, you can see the small red parasites here. These are threadworms. Threadworms will commonly affect the uh, glandular stomach of a wide variety of species in cattle, ostertagia, ostertagi is the one we remember because uh, it's fun to say. Uh, in cats, Ololanus tricuspis will cause a very similar uh, marked proliferation of the gastric epithelium. These worms don't really do much damage. They don't attach, but they sit uh, on top of the epithelium and they wiggle and jiggle and tickle and they cause a catarrhal abomasitis. Um, and tremendous epithelial proliferation. So that's what this, some people have called this appearance Morocco leather in the past. In the sheep, um, Ostertagia or Teledorsagia, that's the name that's been changed recently, Teledorsagia circumcincta 
is uh, a commonly found uh, parasite in the abomasin of sheep, which results in this epithelial proliferation. Because of the epithelial proliferation um, and the rapid growth, the intercellular bridges between the cells are not very good. They're not tightly adhered. And so you can get a leakage of protein uh, from the gastric wall, the abomasal wall, into the lumen, or you can have uh, leakage of pepsinogen, which is produced by the chief cell, into the vasculature. So these are, are signs that you may have uh, this form of trichostrongyle parasitosis, hyperpepsinogenemia or hypoalbuminemia. This is a more severe case of ostertagiosis. Ostertagia is also one of those uh, uh, parasites that for some reason have the ability to undergo hypobiosis. And I don't know how these parasites are able to do it. The small strongyles can do it in horses. Um, the thought is that they will stop their growth go into a, a period of suspended animation, for lack of a better term, until exterior environment is conducive to their proliferation in the environment. So they know that it's cold. They're living in the wall of the abomasum of a ruminant, and they know that it's wintertime outside, so they're going to shut down and then start up again in the spring. So when the eggs come out, they're more likely to be... Uh, be infective. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how a larval nematode can tell the weather outside, but it's well documented certain nematodes. So uh, I will just leave it at that. Hypobiosis, the ability to arrest growth, um, to achieve a environmental and evolutionary advantage. I think that if you are a small ruminant who is not getting fed well, who is overcrowded, who is stressed, it's cold, you've listened, or maybe uh, this, this particular goat uh, is sitting next to you listening to this lecture about all these horrible diseases, um, stress is part of their life. And so this is simply a stress ulcer, uh, usually seen uh, in the abomasum of goats, not uncommonly seen uh, in abattoir studies. And a lot of what we get in small ruminants are abattoir studies from uh, areas of the world that eat a lot of small ruminants, like the Middle East, uh, Africa, and India. But uh, there was a very interesting study uh, in Iran that at an abattoir that showed that uh, ulceration uh, was seen in almost 60% of the animals. Remember, these are animals that are produced for slaughter, so I would imagine overcrowding uh, is part of that. And the ulcers in these goats were more commonly seen in the antrum, so as opposed to the pylorus, which we'll see in carnivores. So antral ulcers in stressed animals. In susceptions, you can see them in any species. Um, always make sure that you examine them carefully before you before you jump to a conclusion because I think all of us have posted animals that were killed almost immediately and you'll see that the GI tract continues to move for several minutes after the death of an animal. And so some intussusceptions can be post-mortem as well. The difference between an anti-mortem and a post-mortem in a susception is obviously the fact that you have swelling uh, and an antemortem in a susception that has blocked peristalsis, um, you can't uh, reduce it easily, I meaning you can't take the two ends and pull them apart of each other. A postmortem in a susception can be easily reduced. What causes in a susceptions? Uh, everything in the world, um, irritation from parasites or large pyrus patches. Uh, surgical interventions, 
just about anything that causes an irritated gut can result in an intussusception as well. As we move into the intestine, here is a goat kid with a dilated gut. There's a lot of milk in the abomasum, and it is a, a young animal. Scours or catarrhal enteritis is not uncommon in young small ruminants and is very difficult to look at one of these and to get a good gross diagnosis, especially in these cases where you don't have a lot of necrosis and hemorrhage, um, and that's why we call them catarrhal enteritis. This is uh, a, a very long list of differentials. Obviously, you have to think about viruses that will affect uh, young animals like rotavirus. Um, a number of bacteria can do this, including uh, the enteropathic forms of E. coli or Campylobacter or Salmonella. Some protozoans like Cryptosporidia or rarely amoeba, and even poor quality uh, milk replacers with a proper level of either lactose or protein can cause uh, catarrhal enteritis in goats. So it's a it's a very large um, differential diagnosis. One virus that I have mentioned before um, and can cause a very similar lesion is lamb dysentery. Now what we're looking at is a dilated gut with a lot of fluids. If you told me that this, that this was rotavirus which causes necrosis of the tips of the villi and a absorptive defect, I would have to say yes, I think that that is uh, uh, very appropriate. But this is a case of lamb dysentery, and lamb dysentery um, is caused by Clostridium perfringens type B. Normally you have abdominal pain and fluid diarrhea in young animals which can occasionally be bloody. Um, it's seen uh, much more acutely in lambs less than three weeks of age. These lambs stop nursing, they become listless and ultimately recumbent and pass sort of a fetid, blood-tinged diarrhea. You can also see this uh, in a more chronic form in older lambs. In England, it's known as pine. And uh, these animals are uh, unthrifty, and because of the pain they have in their belly, they, they have a peculiar stretching motion when they get up. So this is not a condition that uh, I've seen. I don't know if it is in the United States, but it's well described in the rest of the world and it tends to be, this picture might be uh, not the most representative uh, of this particular condition because it's much more of a hemorrhagic enteritis than is shown here. This would be in a young animal maybe a better representation where the the fluid tends to be blood tinged I also do not want to, uh, you to forget about the other clostridial diseases that you can see in young small ruminants, clostridium uh, type C, uh, which is almost always seen in very young animals because the toxins that they produce are protein labile and uh, in adult animals will be digested. Uh, but in young animals, less than two or three days of, of age, they don't have a lot of uh, trypsinogen or trypsin in their gut because they're trying to absorb the macromolecules of colostrum. And so you can't digest that stuff. You have to absorb it. And so clostridium, the toxins of clostridium perfringens type C, the beta toxin is normally uh, inhibited by trypsin, not in young animals and causes a necrohemorrhagic enteritis. So plus that's clostridium, we talked clostridium B, we've talked clostridium C. We've talked about clostridium D causing enterotoxemia uh, in any age of animal, but usually the young best animals causing hemorrhages and enteritis. So a lot of clostridium. You're gonna ask me about clostridium type A. Uh, Clostridium type A is seen in a lot of animals, 
And it has always been a difficult one to actually prove that it causes disease. Um, you can find the toxins, the clostridium perfringens type A in, in a number of animal species. Um, and then it does cause that tympany and bloat in calves, but to my knowledge, not in small ruminants. So a lot of clostridial disease in small ruminants. Know a little bit about each of them and the particular ages. B, C, and D, young animals, especially young in C, a little older in D, up to three weeks, and then uh, usually four months or so. I'm uh, sorry. C, less than three days. B, less than three weeks. D, three to four months. And I'm not saying that those are hard and fast for all of these agents, but that's sort of a good grouping. Another picture of hemorrhagic enteritis in a sheep or a goat. And I think that age is going to be very helpful in, uh, uh, in establishing or at least trying to figure out what you're looking for. The proviso that I'm going to say on this is looking at smears of the gut for robust bacilli doesn't mean anything. Looking at the wall of the devitalized intestine and seeing robust bacilli lined up along the carotid, uh, but but still identifiable enterocytes doesn't mean anything. Culturing and typing these agents starts to bring meaning, but identifying and toxinotyping, if you want the definitive diagnosis, toxinotyping is the way to go. If you have any questions about this, I always encourage you to contact Dr. Francisco, who's all at the San Bernardino lab. He is probably our field's expert on costridial diseases, especially in production animals. Always very helpful and will help you get the right testing. Okay, It's one thing to make a diagnosis for a certification exam saying I think it's clostridium perfringens type C because it's a very young animal, but that does not hold up in the real world if you want a real diagnosis. Wow, on the soapbox twice today. Okay, here's a nice, another great picture. Um, this was taken and published by uh, Dr. Federico Giannetti, who uh, also uh, at the time was working at the California Animal Health uh, Service with Dr. Rizal. This is a picture of yersiniosis in a goat, and you see these focal areas of necrosis and hemorrhage. Histologically, you would see uh, areas of mucosal necrosis with large colonies of bacilli. Uh, small ruminants, this, this paper was a bit of an eye-opener for me. It wasn't something, your seniosis in small ruminants was not something I thought about a lot, um, but now I'm a little more sensitized to your seniosis. These hot gram negatives um, often will cause necrosis of, of lymphoid tissue and each of these areas of hemorrhage probably started out as lymphoid tissue, but hot toxin producing gram negatives like Yersinia like to attack the lymphoid tissue first. So you'll see lesions in the ileum, in the mesoteric lymph nodes, maybe even in the spleen before they get into the portal circulation. If you're eroding through the wall of the ileum, you'll get into the portal circulation. Eventually, you're going to end up in the liver. These hot gram negatives, they don't care about the liver. They just sort of get sucked down the highway of the portal circulation, but they will do the exact same thing and cause necrosis in the liver as well. So your cineosis in small ruminants, don't sleep on that one. This is such a classic picture of intestinal imeriosis in ruminants. It is not a difficult diagnosis to make. We're looking through the wall and you see these white patches of epithelial proliferation in those areas where you're going to find the schizons and the gamons of a variety of imerial species. If we flip it over, you're going to see a great picture 
um, by Fanny Moron. And you can see that these coalescing areas of epithelial proliferation are pretty classic in, uh, uh, in coccidiosis in small ruminants. And this is a uh, significant problem in small ruminants and a lot of great pictures out there. Certainly the, um, the incidence of coccidiosis is increased in young animals, especially those that are overcrowded and marginal husbandry. Um, people always want to try and remember the, the agents of coccidiosis and and for certification exams, I always make sure I know one or two. Now, both sheep and goats have a dozen or more species of Imeria. They don't cross-pollinate with one notable exception. So here's a couple. If you want to jot them down, fine. If, if you're in the real world and you're not taking an exam, you're not in a residency program, probably makes very little difference. Um, but some of the more pathogenic ones in sheep are Imeria asata, Imeria ovinus. That's the one to remember. And the one that you can see in both sheep and goats, and the one that for some reason everyone wants to remember is Imeria nina cola yakimove. And I think it's good because you can say it for sheep and goats. Um, it is pathogenic in both species and is named after a Russian parasitologist, if you wondered how it got such a long name. In goats, some of the more pathogenic ones are Imeria arloingi, Imeria christiansoni, so I guess Dr. Christensen was the one who discovered that, and Imeria ovinoidalis. Now the interesting thing about uh, some of these, like ovinoidalis, um, which is one I've seen several times, is they have the traditional zoites and the traditional microgametes and microgametes, and they have a macrogamete that's absolutely huge, 100 to 250 microns in diameter, and they're gigantic, and you can see them in the intestine, sometimes in the abomasum, and sometimes they will actually get into the vascular or the lymph vasculature and end up in lymph nodes. And it's always a huge surprise and it's fun to show one to the resident. And they have no idea. You know, if you showed them the rest of the gut where there's lots of coccidia, they'd have no trouble with that. But these are just absolutely huge things. So um, so that's a little bit about coccidiosis, as you can imagine, very old, very young, it can be a problem. It's often a self-limiting disease as it is in most other species. So Imeria is the one to remember. And here is one in the abomasum of a sheep. And the gamons are large enough that you can see them. This is a, a one that you may want to remember. There have been a number of, I don't remember hearing about this one as a resident, but there have been a number of papers in the last couple of years. So people start to catch on. And this is Imeria gilruthi in the abomasum of ruminants. Hopefully you're starting to get a picture that small ruminants are often parasitized. And here is a very large adult tapeworm. Um, and these are very dramatic. Um, as a general rule, the pathogenicity of cestodes has always been in question. And um, there are most people, and I think I probably am part of that crowd that believe that cestodes really don't cause much of a problem. They are more, they're more worrisome for the owners, especially if they're passing segments, which these do not, but in dogs and cats which pass segments in a stool and they wiggle around in the poop for a while, that, that always gets them treated. Um, but I don't think cestodes cause too much. We do see cestodes and very large ones like Monesia expansa. It's the name of this one, Monesia expansa in small ruminants. We see them on a fairly regular basis, and we also see emaciated animals on a regular basis. So people say, well, these are obviously causing the emaciation. Um, 
they are not associated with vitamin deficiencies as they are in humans, they probably, in my opinion, don't contribute and are often incidental findings. I think they have a bad rap. But this is a big one, and this is monesia, and you can, you can see this in small ruminants. Here is a, a parasite of the intestinal tract um, that can cause problems. Uh, this is esophagostomum columbianum or esophagostomum venulosum. Uh, esophagostomum columbianum is, is a more pathogenic one. The adult worms will live in the colon, and you see nodules in the wall of the colon, the larval forms will penetrate the, into the muscularis and they will form uh, cystic structures which often, um, if the worm dies, will become very inflamed and then mineralize and you get these whitish black nodules in the wall of the gut. This has been referred to over the years as pimply gut. They're in the colon of sheep they're in the small intestine of, no, I think they're in the colon of both. Sorry, I, I gotta get my locations right. Uh, they're in the colon of both sheep and non-human primates. It's esophagostomum, apiostomum, or radiatum in non-human primates. And they tend to be a little more blackish. Um, I think that the color in this is a result of hemorrhage and inflammation. But they, too, they do tend to mineralize over time. They rarely will perforate, but they can be a source of impaired motility if you have a lot of, uh, of the parasites in the wall, and they can result in irritability and in a susception. So the nodular worm, esophagostum columbianum or esophagostum venulosum. We're looking at a, a section of, of small intestine um, in which the normal wrinkling is, I think we can all ad admit that it is more severe than normal. It is more plicated. And if you were to stretch this bit of gut, it would be very difficult to achieve the normal small uh, mucosa that we've come to expect in the intestine and that is because the lining of this gut is full of macrophages. So uh, as, as Dr. Stromberg would call it, space occupying inflammation. Well, this is seen in a number of diseases of small ruminants, the most prominent being Yoni's disease or paratuberculosis. But you can also see it in other forms of Mycobacterium avium. Mycobacterium paratuberculosis used to be its own species, now it's Mycobacterium avium, variant paratuberculosis, and very rarely some other forms of Mycobacterium avium, which often will affect the gut, can give you a similar lesion. But I think if I was looking at this one, I would go with the Yoni's disease. Um, it's not uncommon in sheep and goats the condition in small ruminants is somewhat different uh, in sheep and goats in that they don't tend to have the severe liquid diarrhea that you will see in cattle. They more commonly have uh, just emaciation, weight loss, etc. The histologic lesion can be extremely variable, uh, but often the lymphangitis is very profound, much more than in cattle. And the intestinal lesion, the histiocytes within the lamina propria, may not be as profound. Ultimately, you know, you have essentially the same condition. 
because these animals don't have diarrhea and they're emaciated, the edema that's associated with the tremendous influx and, and disruption of the barriers of the intestine can be more pronounced in these. Interestingly enough, and I just have a picture, uh, there is a pigmented form of Mycobacterium avium in which the lining of the gut is somewhat yellowish, which is interesting. Um, the lesions of Mycobacterium avium, very paratuberculosis or Yoni's disease, is not restrained to the GI tract. It usually starts at the ileocecal valve and then progresses uh, both forward and backward into the ileum and the colon, but the local lymph nodes, the mesenteric lymph nodes, often will have large accumulations and will be enlarged grossly. And you can even see nodules of uh, macrophages which contain these uh, agents in the liver as well. Anything that's in the gut can get into the portal tract. This is not a difficult histologic diagnosis and is easily confirmed by the presence of uh, numerous uh, acid fast bacteria on a zeal nielsen or a fight Farako stain of the infected intestine. Uh, don't forget that animals with uh, uh, chronic bacterial infections can develop amyloidosis and amyloid has been uh, reported a number of times in goats that are affected with Yoni's disease. This is a, an older picture from Dr. Helen Ackland, but I think the picture originally came from uh, New Zealand or Australia, where she ultimately hails from, has many friends there, and her, her collection from the University of Pennsylvania is absolutely phenomenal. Many of them are in uh, Noah's archive, and, and she was able to draw on some of the, uh, the, the diseases from Australia and New Zealand as well. And this is a condition that I had never heard about until maybe halfway through my career when I was doing posts with John King. And Dr. King had traveled all over the world and he'd done sabbaticals in so many countries, so he's familiar with so many diseases. And one time we had a case of, of clostridiosis in a small ruminant. And one of his differentials was lucerne red gut. And I'm like, Dr. King, have you finally gone around the bend? What the heck is lucerne? Red gut. Well, and it turns out, and here's a picture of lucerne red gut. The gut is absolutely red. You need to know that this animal is from, from New Zealand or Australia, and it was grazing a pasture of lucerne, which is a form of clover. Okay, and so this is not the picture of your typical clostridiosis. If you look, the entire gut is red. It is distended, almost like someone inflated it with a bicycle pump. The spleen is markedly extended. This is a mesenteric torsion. Okay, so uh, it, Lucerne red gut's a very interesting disease. It was first described in the mid-70s. And grazing this form of clover results in a net shrinkage of the rumen and the reticulum and a net increase in the hindgut, including the cecum in these animals, and the extra space in the abdomen allows the entire, the, you know, the enlarged cecum, and it sort of pulls the entire gut, and, the, and because the rumen is shrunk, everything has the ability to torse. And that's why I got the name Lucerne Red Gut. So I'm thinking that if you're living in New Zealand or you're living in Australia and you're seeing this picture, you're nodding your head because you've heard of it. The rest of the world has not. For most of you, it's going to be as new and as interesting a disease as it was for me uh, many years ago with Dr. King. So Lucerne, red gut. You know, I, I would never put this on test, at least in this country, because everyone would probably go to clostridiosis. And, and, uh, but it's a great picture. And... Uh, that's all I can say about Lucerne Red Gut.
Well, we're running out of uh, GI pictures. And that's maybe not a bad thing because we're well over an hour. Um, this is nothing special. This is what we so often see in the goats that come to necropsy in our area. And if you're looking for the lesion, you can really see all of the organs very well in the abdomen of this animal because the animal has absolutely no fat at all. This is diffuse, severe, serous atrophy of the fat. This animal was emaciated. Look how small the liver is. And when you look at the liver in emaciated animals, they tend to be small. They tend to be flabby. There's not a lot of fat to put in hepatocytes to give it any bulk. Same thing in the pancreas. You will see that the pancreas, if you look at the excrement tissue, you will see very few zymogen granules because this animal is chronically starving. And it just doesn't make the uh, uh, those zymogen granules. The, the pancreas might look normal grossly, but histologically it will be very basophilic, very, very few of those red granules. So I call that exocrine pancreatic atrophy. And you see in chronically starved animals. And of course, you're hard pressed to find an adipocyte anywhere in the mesentery of these animals. They're generally, if you find them, they're very small. You may have some some necrosis. They may be uh, somewhat mineralized, have a, a either a bluish or a pinkish sheen to them, but you're certainly not going to find it. And this is the tragedy of uh, so many uh, people who who want to have goats. They just don't understand the necessity to feed them appropriate diets and so that they can subsist, you know, on whatever is out there. Just another picture of the severe serous atrophy with the gelatinous material that you so often find. I, I often call these the melting goats or the melting goat syndrome because they have this gelatinous material everywhere from the uh, uh, the abdomen to the around the coronary arteries of the heart where you just see this gelatinous material and if you crack open the bones of these animals you can literally pour the bone marrow out into your hand because it's just jelly so melting goat syndrome if I ever hear that again on there where you got that one from okay and we're just ending up we're in the colon, and these are whipworms. Uh, goats do get uh, whipworms. Thank you, Mahogany Caesar, for this great picture. This is Trichurus ovis, and you see it in the uh, uh, cecum in the colon of goats um, in very severe infection. Most of the animals show no clinical signs. Um, in very severe infections in young animals, you may see... Uh, hypoproteinemia and weight loss and and some people have said that these are cause immunosuppression I think that that's probably an overstatement and they're seen in immunosuppressed animals for a variety of disease including poor nutrition so um, the other thing that let's let's go back and, and tie in one of the first slides with one of the last ones poor nutrition and bad mouth just because you see a starving animal you don't want to assume it's been fed poorly or it didn't have access to food or whatever. You always want to check the mouth because animals of all species with bad dentition aren't able to get the appropriate nutrition. So we've tied the front end of the GI tract with the back end of the GI tract. We've looked at a lot of great pictures in between. We're going to finish up the GI system in the next lecture with diseases of the liver. I usually lump liver and biliary system together. I don't think I have anything that involves the uh, biliary system in, in sheep and goats, but we got some great liver diseases to talk about, especially copper toxicity, which you don't want to miss out on. So I will see you next time. Until then, be safe, be happy, good luck, good life, enjoy the holidays, and above all, stay safe.